Just wait. Great. Hello and welcome both uh, to our students here in the classroom and also to our alumni that are online today. Um, my name is Amanda Kalau Marino, Associate Director of Alumni Affairs. Um, I want, am proud to welcome everyone back to, to uh, this series here, um, particularly those that are joining us here online. Um, and also a huge thank you to our students for letting us do this uh, each week uh, here in the classroom and letting our alumni and parent community uh, peek into your class every week. It's really been a great experience. Um, during today's reading, this is for our online guests, you will notice a chat uh, function on the right hand side of your screen. Please feel free to introduce yourself, include a class share if you'd like, and any questions that you have, if you could um, enter them in that chat, chat field there, I will um, try my hardest to get those into the discussion today. So without any further ado, um, Jane Pynchon is here to introduce um, Tessa Hadley. And then we have a quick announcement from Matt. Ago, Francis Warren had a story published in the New Yorker the very week she came to Colgate in the Living Writers series. She had taught at Colgate. This week, there's a story in the New Yorker, <laughs> The Trojan Prince, by another writer here for the Living Writers series, again in the very week she visits Colgate. She too has talked here, this time in the Colgate Writers Conference that takes place on this campus in June. But of course, Tessa Hadley is a regular at the New Yorker. Indeed, four of the stories in the extraordinary 2007 collection we have been reading in the Living Writers course, Sunstroke Sunstro and Other Stories, having first appeared there. About the collection, the New York Times book review in its lead piece talked about Hadley's miraculous short stories. Delft and resident, resonant, they encapsule moments of hope and humiliation in a kind of shorthand of different lives lived. Hadley never fails to surprise, but her surprises are understated not the aha faker of some short fiction, but the small shifts in expectations or results that, that's deeply felt but doesn't show, like the twitch of a rudder that sets a boat gliding on a new course. Tessa Hadley is a writer of beautiful books. These include Henry James and the Imagination of Pleasure, Cambridge University Press, 2002, Tessa has a PhD in literature and special interests in, along with Henry James, Jane Alston, as we heard this, this afternoon, uh, Jean Reese and Elizabeth Bowen. Her books include three novels, Accidents in the Home in 2002, long listed for the Guardian First Book Award, Everything Will Be All Right, 2003, the Master Bedroom 2007, published in the same year as Sunstroke. And a fourth, coming out at least in England in January 2011, The London Train. She has said about her work, it seems to me a primary task for the novelist is to find expression for what's new in the present moment, to evolve an aesthetic to express it, to wrest something new out of the novel tradition, to fit a new age and capture it, get it down in words, as she does, as she does. Tessa lives in Cardiff and teaches literature and creative writing at Bath Spa University. She reviews regularly for the London Review of Books. She is married to the director and writer, Eric Hadley. She is the mother of many sons. <laughs> Please join me in the palpable pleasure of welcoming Tessa Hadley back to Coke. Thank you very much, Jane. And, uh...
really lovely to be here again. Thank you very much for having me. We were here in summer last time, so this is a completely different vision of the place, but it's still looking beautiful. Uh, I've only got three sons, by the way. <laughs> but my husband uh, has six, of which three are mine, so he's, he's the miracle, son-wise. <laughs> Okay. I was actually going to, when I first talked to Jennifer and Jane about this reading, I was going to read The Trojan Prince, the one that's just in The New Yorker, but now it feels a bit boring. It's out there. Um, so I'm going to read a, new, a newer story, which also will be in The New Yorker at some point in the next few weeks or months. Um, it's a completely freestanding short story, but it's also going to be the first chapter of my new novel. I've written four chapters, and each of them sort of operates freestanding and is part of the whole. So don't tell me that you think it's really no good. <laughs> OK. It's called Honour. My mother and I lived alone. My father was supposed to be dead. And I only found out years later that he'd left, walked out when I was 18 months old. I should have guessed this. I should have seen the signs or the absence of them. Why hadn't we kept any of his things to treasure? Why, whenever he came up in conversation, which was hardly ever, did my mother's face tighten, not in grief or regret, but in disapproval? The same expression she had if she tasted some food or drink she didn't like. She was fussy. We were both fussy. Fussy together. Why did none of our relatives or friends ever mention his name, which was Bert, unpoetically? What had he died of exactly? Lungs, my mother said, <laughs> shortly. She had hated his smoking. But it didn't really matter. We were pretty happy living à deux, at least I was. This was in the 1950s, then the early 60s. I was born in 1956, so all those things were current and powerful then, which seem quaint now. Shame and secrecy and the fear that other people would worm themselves into your weakness and that their knowledge of how you had lapsed or failed would eat you out from the inside. My mother used to wear white gloves to go to the shops in summer. She used to carry a basket on her arm, real willow shaped like a segment of orange with a tan leather flap and a fastener like a little brass barrel turning in a brass slot. Later on, when I was a teenager, I thought she was dowdy in her boxy good coats and silk scarves and low-heeled court shoes. But looking at the photographs now, I see that it's me who's a fright. Overweight then, with my eyes made up like black pits. And that she's elegant, even kind of sexy in a cautious, respectable kind of way. She had to go out to work in an office to support us. So I spent a lot of time with my nana, my mother's mother, who lived just round the corner from our flat. There's another thing. Didn't I wonder why we didn't visit any grandparents on my father's side? Nana was miniature, with a tiny featured face and black eyes like a mouse or a shrew. On her cheeks, there really was a kind of downy pale fur if you caught her in a certain light. And when I was very young, I had liked to stroke it. She bought her clothes from the children's department, cheaper, and went to the hairdressers every week to have her hair set in skimpy grey-brown rolls pinned to her scalp, not out of vanity, but as if this was a punishing routine it was her duty to submit to. There were stickers on the underside of every piece of furniture in Nana's house saying who should have it in the event of her death. <laughs> Edna, that was my mother, Frank, Uncle Frank, Ray, Uncle Ray. This was when she was in her early 60s. That old pair of steps, no thank you, Mum said, but only when Nana was out of earshot. I had already decided what I wanted, a jewellery box I was very keen on, which played music when the lid was opened. Nana was also a widow, a real one. I didn't remember my grandpa. Her house was very bare and there wasn't much furniture in it. This was because she was poor 
but also because she was continually in the process of clearing out, giving things away, as if she was trying to weigh less and less, as if life itself was a mess she was gradually getting to the bottom of. In the summer, when it wasn't too cold, I used to play upstairs in the bedrooms while Nana in her housecoat cleaned downstairs. What was there to clean? She survived in that house as neatly as a mouse living on crumbs. I played with the jewellery box and with my dolls and with a travel set Uncle Ray had given Nana, pots made of soft, thick plastic with blue screw tops. You were meant, I suppose, to transfer your assorted creams and unguents into these to take away with you. But Nana only used Nivea and never went anywhere. I can remember being flooded with happiness once, alone, apart from the dolls, in Nana's bedroom. The floorboards were stained dark brown up to the edges of the rug. I was looking up at the underside of the bed, its springs and the flock mattress with its pom-poms turned each week. The dressing table with its back to the window blocked the light. Silky mauve curtains were drawn partway across behind it to keep out prying eyes or save the furniture for, from fading. The window was open three inches at the top for airing. A breeze was tickling the curtains. My chest swelled with the full awareness of the moment, as if I was breathing in a thick, different medium. Heady, dust motes swam in the air. I turned my hand in them and thought, I'm alive in this world. Was this before I went to school? It must have been. I didn't hate school, but it was the end of that rich, slow, expansive time when I was free. Mum and I were close when I was a child. We deluded ourselves that we were alike and would always be the best of friends. We snuggled together with hot water bottles under the eiderdown on the sofa to watch Compact on TV or The Man from Uncle. We both had temperaments, and it was fine as long as these were pulling in tandem. Both of us were fastidious and opinionated and full with disapprovals of other people's taste, which we kept diplomatically between ourselves. Later, our tastes diverged and we disapproved of one another. <laughs> Nana said we should move in with her. She couldn't see why we were wasting our money renting in a separate place. I didn't take any notice of this. I thought of Nana as... Harmless, lightweight, easy to brush away. My uncles teased her patiently. They found her comical. But I knew from the way my mother's face shuttered over at the idea of moving back into her, her old home that for her it was a living danger, a trap that could close on her again at any time. If Mum smoked at Nana's kitchen table, she'd hated my father doing it, then took it up herself, Nana whisked the ashtray away the moment she'd finished, tipped the ash into the bin, rinsed it under the tap, wiped it off, first with the dishcloth and then with a tea towel. Mum was vulnerably exposed without a husband. I didn't see this for a long time. The only way for Mum to defend against Nana's bleaching, purging worldview was to defy it, wear scent and lipstick every day for the office not bother to take up the carpet every time she cleaned. Treat me for her birthday at a Bernie Inn, which was a waste, as Nana had predicted. Overawed and stubborn, I wouldn't eat a thing. Mum came, as usual, in her stocking feet and petticoat into my bedroom one morning with the pile of sheets and blankets she had slept in, neatly folded. We only had one bedroom with a double bed in it, almost filling the space. Mostly, I slept in there and Mum had the sofa. I liked to lie in bed, listening to her, getting ready next door, moving about quietly so as not to wake me. I would close my eyes when she came in, pretending to stretch and yawn. I've had a telephone call, she said. Stella? Auntie Andy needed somewhere to stay for a while. Telephone calls were a big event. The telephone belonged to the woman in the flat below whose number we gave out only for emergencies. 
The call must have come very early or very late the night before. Who rang? I asked, suspicious. Frank. Andy rang him, trying to get in touch with me. You'll have to budge up. I'll be in the bed with you tonight. We'll give Andy the sofa. She stood for too long, hanging on to the pile of bedding, looking down at me, seeing me and not seeing me. There was something in her face I didn't like, crumbled and damp. Usually the mask of her brightness was securely in place, spirited, capable. My mother was quite a toughie. She could be brisk about other people's troubles. She couldn't afford to waste much sympathy. She had herself and me to look out for. No one else was looking out for us. I was about eight or nine at the time this happened. I could hardly remember at first who Auntie Andy was. Actually, she was a relative of my father's, married to his cousin, and she was the only one in that family who'd made any effort to keep in touch. You've probably seen her once or twice a year. At Christmas, she dropped me off a selection box of chocolate bars. She might have been moved to this kindness because she had a son about my age, Charlie. Of course, then, Mum had to buy a selection box for Charlie, too. Andy wasn't really Mum's type. She was a bit of a mouse, small and plump, faded, gingery hair scraped back from her face with hair grips, blotchy, dusty skin, no makeup. She used to wear a little beige beret, tilted to one side of her head, inappropriately jaunty. She was shy and hadn't had much to say, sitting with a plate of our Christmas cake balanced on her lap, fat knees spread in her tweedy skirt, feet crossed at the ankles where the nylons wrinkled. She'd said, you've got it very nice here, Edna, looking round. Mum was still looming above my bed, gripping on the pile of blankets. There's just one thing, she warned. When Auntie Andy comes, you mustn't mention Charlie. So something had happened to Charlie. Charlie had only come in with Andy once. Inches smaller than me, ginger like her, but bursting unlike her with sly and hostile energy, ready with contempt for girls and women. He'd ignored his mother when she tried to pass him her handkerchief and wiped his nose on his, his sleeve instead. In one of his eyes, there was a blot, as if black ink had spilled across the iris, and his stare was skewed, unnervingly off target. His hard brown lace-up shoes, polished as conkers, had made me think of the boys kicking in the queue for school dinner. I refused to ask what had happened to him. I didn't want to have unpacked for me whatever unseemly thing had made my mother's face pulpy. I liked the scandals we read about in magazines, but they were safely glazed over with falsehood and repetition. Glimpses of raw adult complications appalled me in the same way I was appalled by the sight of an egg splatted in the pan with its yolk broken and leaking. I hated egg. <laughs> anyway, Mum wouldn't have told me she was inflexible in keeping secrets. Almost as an afterthought, she added, and don't mention Aunt Uncle Derek. I hadn't even known his name was Derek. I'd never met him. Andy was there when I got back from Nana's. I always went to Nana's after school. I was allowed to walk home on my own after Nana had given me supper. Spam sandwiches, lettuce and tomatoes with vinegar shaken over them out of a cut glass bottle. Nana already knew all about Auntie Andy coming, but she wouldn't say anything to me directly. Not saying things was her specialty. She had quivered with worry, though, while she made my food. She had a horror of any publicity or, or exposure that touched the family, however remotely. I only hope Edna knows what she's doing, she fretted, not quite to anyone. And I was dreading that I would arrive home in the middle of a big fuss. I couldn't bear crisis. The huddles of women, their lowered voices, smouldering glances, shutting the children out and yet looping them in, tantalising them to the dark, sticky mucky centre. My auntie Jean, Frank's wife, was the worst. Girls practised huddling in the school playground. Mostly, 
Mum didn't like fuss any more than I did. Whatever it was that had happened to Andy and Charlie and Uncle What's-His-Name had been bad enough to shock her out of her usual poise. I had vowed to myself that I would never be looped in. Andy was sitting quietly at the end of, a so of the sofa in a tweed skirt that looked like the same one she had worn last time. How are you, Stella? she said kindly. How was school? She did look odd in some way. What? I began gabbling about how well I had done in my mental arithmetic test and how we had drawn around plastic stencils of the United Kingdom in our books with little holes to put your pencil where the cities were and how I had to bring something in for the nature table next week now that it was spring. I knew my mother was frowning at me urgently because by talking about school I must indirectly be bringing up the subject of Charlie, though I couldn't imagine Charlie ever shining at mental arithmetic or contributing to the nature table but I didn't want there to be any silences out of which raw truths might tumble. Auntie Andy said calmly, admiringly, that I sounded like a clever girl. Her face was rather white. It reminded me of a girl at school who had been slapped for extreme insolence. They usually only hit the boys. When this girl walked back to her desk, she was in a sort of smiling days, pale with shock. What was odd about Auntie Andy, I realised, was that her shyness had been blasted out of her by whatever had happened, the way an explosion leaves people deaf afterwards. A few months ago, when she had sat in the same place on our sofa eating cake, she had been stuck for anything to say, apologetic, glancing round at the walls of our flat for inspiration, Mum had been imperiously, chillingly polite. With hindsight, I suppose she'd chosen this as the right register for relations with my father's family. Andy had blushed and stumbled over her words, and I had guessed that her feet were hurting her in her stilettos. The time Charlie came in with her, she had been suffused with maternal pride and surprise. Can I really have made this? Touching his hair and his shoulders surreptitiously, making him wriggle away but she had also suffered seeing his nose run in front of us. Now, she sat almost serenely, as if nothing ordinary could touch her. Well, of course, it couldn't. I wanted to come here, she said to my mother, with no hint of worry that she might be in imposition. I remembered how nicely you'd done it up. When they asked me if I had anywhere to go to, I expect they thought they'd go, I'd go to my sister's. But to be honest, Edna, I don't want anything to do with a whole lot of them just now. That first afternoon, she must have been in the middle of a severe trauma, as we'd call it these days. I don't suppose she knew what she was doing or saying. But this effect of the loss of her shyness never faded away afterwards. It wasn't that she became bold or greedy of attention or anything like that, far from it. Shyness transformed into something like itself, but different. Reserve or dignity. The only outward sign of extremity was that they were drinking sherry, or Mum was drinking it and smoking with hasty, nervous fingers. Auntie Andy's glass on the coffee table in front of her looked untouched. Go on. Mum said tenderly. It'll do you good. I'd never heard her tender like that before for any adult. Even our mutual appreciation was mostly chaffing and teasing. Obediently, Andy picked up the glass to sip, but something happened to it between the table and her mouth, as if her hand simply wasn't under her control. Her arm jerked helplessly, and the sherry spilled over the top of the glass, a big gout of it all over her skirt and our carpet. She wasn't just shaking. It was something more violent, equivalent to an avalanche or a volcano. In Andy's old self, she would have been mortified, but she only put the sherry back carefully on the table, folding her hands in her lap again, while Mum kneeled beside her, blinking in the smoke from her cigarette, wiping up 
blotting the mark out of Andy's skirt with a tea towel. I saw that, if anything, it was Mum who was shy now. Not shy of Andy in herself, but as if whatever had happened to her was added on like an annex to her personality forever, daunting and exacting a kind of homage of respect and service. I supposed that as soon as I was sent to bed, the two women would talk and I would hear the too dramatic music of their murmured, scandalising revelations and commiserations penetrating through the dividing wall. I'd heard my mother talk like this with Auntie Jean and felt betrayed because usually we made fun of Jean. It was our joke that she knew the gossip before it even happened. Jungle Telegraph, Mum called it. However, when Mum told me to get my pyjamas on, Auntie Andy announced that she would go to bed now, too. The doctor's given me some pills, she said, so I should be all right. I didn't get much sleep last night. My mother didn't try to explain about the sofa, that this meant she, too, would have to go to bed hours before her usual time. As a rule, she never turned in before 11 or midnight. She made up the sofa for Andy with clean sheets, boiled water for a hot bottle for her, and then Mum and I were shut in, alone together. It was strange to have her undressing in the room with me when I was still awake, tussling to get out of her underwear under her nylon nighty, pulling her brassiere through a sleeve, settling down beside me with her book and her glass of water. She couldn't concentrate on what she was reading, and her restlessness and exasperation communicated itself. When she put out the bedside light, I whined that I couldn't sleep with the light on, I could feel the frustration of the long hours stretching out ahead of her in the dark when she was so charged up with vitality and energy. So what happened to Charlie? I whispered. Oh, Stella, not now, for goodness sake. Heaving the bedclothes over, she turned her back on me decisively. For a while, we both lay awake, listening for signs of whatever unimaginable reverie was unfolding in the next room. There was nothing to hear. Next morning, when Mum got up, Auntie Andy was already dressed, sitting there on the sofa with her slapped face and vague smile, and all the sheets and blankets neatly folded. On the way to school, Mum told me that Charlie was dead, flinging the word at me impatiently as if it was somehow my fault, and I ought to have guessed by now, as indeed I had guessed from the beginning. The real word spoken between us worked its ravages nonetheless. I resented Charlie with a pure rage. Why couldn't anyone else have been dead? He seemed a usurper in a realm that gave him a huge advantage of pity and terror. He surely didn't belong there with his ugly, stamping feet. Only his squint. It had made its impression, that inky blot, must have been a sign of difference and romance, marking him apart. Dead? How? I insisted. And she looked down at me, bright and smart in her office outfit, with distaste, I'm sure. A nasty accident, she said. I couldn't ask for shame. What accident? But the indefiniteness squirmed in my imagination, taking on foul forms. You're not to repeat a word about it to anyone, is that clear? Not one word or I'll take my hand to you. She rarely smacked me, though she quite often threatened it. I was wounded that my mother could think I would want to pass on our contaminating secret. Becoming the centre of one of those huddles of girls, darkly informed, didn't appeal. Anyhow, I feared I wouldn't carry it off. Somehow the tables would be turned and the dirty story would stick to me, making me a pariah. I was too loudly insistent too shapeless and sexless, too good at English comprehension for those girls to trust. My instinct in those days anyway was to smother any unpleasant truth, push it back into its hole. I was, rather abstractly, 
enthusiastic over dogs and horses because the emotions these roused seemed to me cleaner and problematic. I had a dreamy image of myself running through long grass down a steep field with a collie dog jumping up beside me trying to lick my face. After long deliberation, I had decided collies was my favourites. This image was my idea of nature and had in my private world an almost religious resonance. Determinedly, all that day at school, I held Charlie at bay, inventing games to play with my couple of oddball friends. We lived together in a farmhouse on an island. A portion of the playground was the sea, and we couldn't walk on it, only row across it when we needed to get to the shops to buy provisions. Sometimes there were dreadful storms. Here, boy, I whistled and clicked my tongue commandingly, fed imaginary sugar lumps to imaginary horses on my hand held out flat. What had happened to Charlie was worse than anything my fears could dredge up. It all came out in the court case. Needless to say, I was never in the court, but my mother got as much time off from the office as she could to sit through it with Auntie Andy. The office were very understanding, even if that meant they didn't pay her. So she heard almost all of it, and over the years it filtered through to me. Also, my nana kept the newspaper cuttings, which I found when she died. Although in those days the coverage wasn't as lurid as it would be now, and not everything that came out in court got into the papers. It was a surprise that nana had kept the cuttings. She had never let mum talk about the case. She certainly didn't manifest any prurient interest in the detail. What else to expect, anyway, from my father's family? I don't want to know, Edna. Apparently, for years, Uncle Derek had been hitting Auntie Andy. Andrea, she was, in the newspaper reports. His own mother admitted in court that he had a violent temper, though she also said that Andy should have known how to get round him. Perhaps Uncle Derek's father was a wife-beater, too. The defence tried to make out that Andy had goaded her husband with her passivity, her unresponsiveness. The whole topic of men's violence against their families was kept better hidden in those days. People had mixed feelings about it. It was disgusting, but it was also confusedly part of the suffering essence of maleness, like the smell of tobacco and the beard growth. I think that sexuality itself was sometimes imagined by the women in my family as a kind of violence that must be submitted to buried deep in the privacy of domestic life. Presumably, the implication of the case for the defence was that Auntie Andy might have driven her husband to murder out of sexual frustration. They made a great point of Derek's sobriety. He never touched a drop, Auntie Andy loyally testified, and his good reputation at his place of work. He was a salesman in a car showroom. He brought home very good money. Who knows how Uncle Derek would have fared in court if he'd killed Auntie Andy. On the night in question, however, he didn't. He arrived home from work at the usual time and his tea wasn't ready. Tea in this context meaning meat and two veg, not Earl Grey and triangles of sandwich. It wasn't ready because Andy had been asked to come in to talk to the teacher about Charlie after school. She hadn't been going to tell her husband about this, but it came out inevitably as their row unravelled. She had thought perhaps that Charlie was in trouble. He sometimes got into fights in the playground. But it turned out that the teacher was worried about Charlie's slowness in learning to read. Because I don't have any other children, Andy said in court, I didn't know he was slow. I wish I'd known. Derek had had a bad day altogether. He'd been working on a deal to sell a fleet of cars to a driving school which had fallen through. My mother said that they made Andy show them on a plan how he chased her around the house, punching and kicking her from room to room. That's why I ran out into the street, she said, without my coat or my bag, and I couldn't go back inside because I didn't have my key. He'd never have let me in. But I didn't want the neighbours watching while I hung about out there in the cold. 
so I thought I'd better go to my sister's, who only lives around the corner. She'd waited a couple of hours for him to cool down. She had gone to her sister's before in the middle of one of these rows and left Charlie with his father. When police officers saw you later that evening, the defence objected, they didn't observe any signs of violence on your person. She said he never hit her where the marks would show. Could you speak up, please? He, he said he didn't want her flaunting it to everyone. They had found Charlie's body in the bath with no water in it. They asked Andy where her son was when she'd left the house. As far as she knew, he was in the living room eating his tea, beans on toast because the chops weren't ready, off his lap in front of the television. He might or might not have been his aware that his parents were quarrelling. They had both of them always tried to keep him out of it. Andy had been planning to get out his reading book later, as the teacher had recommended, although she hadn't been very hopeful that he would agree to work on his spellings with her. He'd had a mind of his own, she said. She repeated that Derek had never hurt Charlie before. He wasn't a bad father. He had been worried about his son's problem with his eyes. He had even come with her to see the doctor. But she agreed with the defence. She shouldn't have left Charlie alone with him that night. She would never forgive herself. She didn't know now what she had been thinking of. They had arrested Derek in Nottingham. She had no idea why he'd gone there. He had no connection with the place. I really wished at the time when Auntie Andy was staying with us and then later during the trial when we saw a lot of her again that I hadn't known any of this. And I didn't know all of it then, though I did know about the bath and it haunted me. I tried not to listen when they talked about it, mostly my mother with Auntie Jean, but I couldn't help being curious against my better judgment, as if amongst the detail there was information I needed for my own survival. Innocent seeming fragments would get in past my defences, the reading book, Nottingham, chops for tea, then stick to my imagination like tar. Inevitably, they got to know at school about my connection with the case. It was almost as bad as if they'd shunned me. A deputation of older girls came up to me one playtime with solemn faces and presented me with a posy of flowers, probably picked out of the front gardens on their way to school, tied up in raffia from the craft cupboard. They wanted to say how sorry they were about my little cousin, one of them actually stroked my hair as if I moved her to spontaneous pity. I wanted to tell them that I'd hardly known Charlie, that he was a snotty-nosed kid and I'd hated him and that he would have hated me back if he'd even deigned to notice my existence. But I didn't dare. I knew they wouldn't be able to forgive me if I cheated them of their syrupy, pleasurable sorrowing. So I thanked them and said I would give the flowers to my auntie on my way home. I buried them in a dustbin. I was accorded a kind of sepulchral respect in school for a couple of weeks and then they forgot about me. From time to time, when I was alone in a room, I would suddenly have full, chilling consciousness that Charlie had been alive inside his own head once, as I was at that moment inside mine. And also that that person, which he really was, had undergone those things I knew were factually true in a present moment as real as this one and continuous with mine because it had baked beans in it and a, a bathroom with familiar boring sink and towels and toilet. My mind expanded to take in new possibilities. This open-air recognition was what lay in wait behind all the gloating, smothering words. Poor little chappy. A blast of wind blowing through space, icy clean. Most of the time, naturally, when Auntie Andy wasn't around, I hardly thought about Charlie. I got on with my life. My mother used to say, in one of her set pieces, that she had never known what courage was until she saw how Andrea stood up to the lawyers in court. She was so perfectly polite and patient, 
but she never let them get under her skin, I couldn't have kept my composure the way she did. Actually, once the trial was over, the two of them didn't see that much of one another. Their lives took them in different directions. They had never really had much in common. Andy didn't become a different person after Charlie was killed. She never became one of the kind of bright, quick, funny women mum chose for her best friends. Andy was always rather sweet and blank and, what's the word? Not conventional, because mum was every bit as conventional. Andy was receptive, like a deep vessel into which life was poured. If this terrible particular thing hadn't been poured into her, she would have been happier, it goes without saying, but less of a person. She was filled out by her fate. I actually think this is quite rare, this capacity to become the whole shape of the accidents that happen to you. And it wasn't just a passive thing. I remember when Auntie Jean first came round, when, while Andy was staying with us, Jean had a big forthright bust and piled up black hair. She wore dangling earrings that were vaguely gypsy-ish. When Andy came out of the bedroom where she'd been lying down, Jean knelt on the floor in front of her, wrapping her arms round Andy's knees, sobbing extravagantly. I don't know how you could bear it, she said. I know I couldn't. Jean had three boys. The murder had cleared a social space around Andy. People didn't know how to address themselves to her. Probably Jean was just trying to broach that space in her overblown way. You can't deny that her gesture matched the extremity of the case. But Andy wasn't either touched or embarrassed. She stood very still and unresponsive until Jean let go. I'm sorry, I don't like scenes, Andy coolly said. I'm sure Uncle Derek was less interesting than his wife. He wasn't interesting just because he had killed someone. In my adult life, I lived for a while in a house with brick steps down into a narrow coal cellar like a passage to a dead end where we kept the brooms and buckets and broken things we hadn't got around to fixing. It used to flood with filthy water at certain times of year, and now I imagine Uncle Derek's inner life like this, nasty and cramped and musty smelling, shut away from daylight, subject to the drag of tides of violence. The little despotism he installed inside the four walls of his home only mattered in its relation to the whole towering, mahogany-coloured, tobacco-smelling, reasonable edifice of male superiority in the world outside, and mattered because of its consequences in other lives. I know my mother reported that in court he'd said he'd got the worst of a bad bargain in his wife. They did let him out of jail eventually, I believe, after he'd served 15 years of his sentence and he went to settle in some part of the country where he wasn't known. During that time Auntie Andy was staying with us, Mum left me alone in the flat with her on Saturdays when she went out shopping. Sometimes Andy played dolls with me. This was a new experience. The adults I knew didn't play with children unless it was something organised like cricket. But Andy didn't put on a childish voice, and she entered into the reality of the different dolls' characters and sensitivities with what seemed like an authentic interest, almost naive. I checked in her face to make sure she wasn't teasing. We undressed, undressed them in their tiny clothes, flipping them over to do up the poppers, skewering plastic boots onto hard, pointing feet. After the court case was over, Andy made a dress for my teenage doll, layered skirts in pink nylon trimmed with minute roses made of satin ribbon. Unbelievably pretty, though it was a bit tight and wouldn't do up down the back. Sometimes when she and I were alone in the flat, Auntie Andy went into the other room to lie down, and I heard her crying, although Mum said to Jean that she never did. It didn't occur to me to try and comfort her. I would pretend to carry on with my play, feeling miserably guilty. I was only a child. I had nothing I could offer, and I must be a living reproach that I wasn't Charlie. 
though Andy never made me feel this by any word or sign. Auntie Andy had to find a job. She had to get a divorce and a place to live by herself. She couldn't go back to that house, obviously. And all of this worked out well for her. I think she must have come to our flat in the first place, not only out of a rev revulsion against everything to do with her old life, but also because my mother's solitary, cheerful style, frilly aprons and nail polish and lemon yellow guest towels, had signaled to her, even before the disaster, a vision of possibilities different to the ones she knew. She imagined daily life with Uncle Derek. And Mum was honoured by Auntie Andy's choosing us. It seemed a consecration of Mum's situation as a single woman, managing bravely by herself. Although Andy's staying was an inconvenience and a strain too, my mother acquitted herself with exemplary generosity. She really did. And then, within a couple of years, they both found themselves a man, as if that had been the whole point of the enterprise. Andy went to work on the factory floor of the chocolate manufacturers where Uncle Ray was in the accounts office. She made a little face of apology when she told us, as if she knew it was beneath her, wife of a car salesman. But in fact, she enjoyed the company of the women there, though she kept aloof from the roughest of their bantering and raucous kidding. I saw this because Ray got me a summer job at the factory when I was 16, an awful job, lifting off the moulds from the hot chocolate puddings. She brought us paper bags of half-priced imperfect chocolates whenever she visited. Violet creams and crunchies and Turkish delight, my favourite. I picked off flakes of the chocolate with my teeth and then ate the jelly. Even after she married, Andy went on working there. Carrying on for the moment, she said suggestively. Her new husband, Phil, was lugubrious with faded good looks, stick thin, not long after their wedding, Auntie be Andy began hinting with proud smiles that she might be pregnant. She must have been 40-ish by then. She was a lot older than my mother. Some of this I picked up at the time from conversations between Mum and Auntie Jean. Their twilight tones alerted me. I knew they must be talking about bodies. Apparently, she suffered from real morning sickness. Her stomach swelled, her breasts were sore, they hardly ever used that word, breasts. It was reserved for medical matters only uttered in dropped voices. But in the end, nothing came of it. It was a false alarm. Doesn't it just break your heart, Jean said, mopping her eyes. <coughs> Andy never did have another baby, although that pattern of phantom pregnancy repeated itself over and over, well into her fifties, by which time it had become a bit of a joke among the people who knew her, though not an unkind one. To Uncle Phil's credit, he never gave the least sign of scepticism over her symptoms. He was punctilious in his attentions, urging her to put her feet up, bringing the barley water with soda she'd suddenly taken a fancy to. Andy talked about her disappointments, as if they were miscarriages, but Jean didn't believe she'd ever really conceived in her second marriage. My mother said she didn't know it was none of her business. However bitterly these disappointments were felt in private, nothing altered Andy's queenly kindness and distance. As far as I know, these phantoms were the only outward sign, as her life went on, of continuing trauma from what had happened. I can't help feeling, thinking about it now, that there was an element of histrionic performance in them, contrasting with the rest of her reserve. Exacting our sympathetic goodwill under false pretenses, she claimed some latitude, some indulgence, in return for the magnitude of what she had undergone and what she had lost, which could never be restored.
your work? Perhaps two or three. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a complicated question. Um, I was talking earlier to the students. I really, I'm a great admirer of Colm Tobin, the Irish writer. Uh, I think he's marvellous, just reading his new stories. Uh, Irish writers, on the whole, actually, I love Claire Keegan, and I love John McGahan, who's not really a contemporary, no longer alive, but recent and feels very contemporary. So, strangely, I've come up with three Irish... That doesn't mean I don't like any of my uh, mainland British contemporaries. <laughs> Okay. I love to talk about <laughs> Elizabeth Bowen. Uh, I, I just think she's a really wonderful, great writer, one of the big 20th century writers. I, I think more and more people are agreeing with us, aren't they? And suddenly her name is around and she's being taught, which is always very important and so on. Um, Marvellous sort of modern stylist and yet... At, um, belonging, I suppose, in the Jamesian tradition, but I don't know how useful that is. I feel she's brilliant at encapsulating the 20s and 30s and the 50s and the 60s. In, and I love her baroque, hard sentences with their perverse sentence order and their sort of... She's, she's never says a slack word writes. She never writes. I'm sure she never said a slack word either. Um, if you listen to her talking, she's, her accent is astonishing. It's like cut glass in its upper classness. Nobody talks like that. Even the Queen doesn't talk like that now. <laughs> um, she never writes a weak or ordinary word. There's a sort of effort to, 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 to get things newly and freshly in every sentence. And I feel like that, that's both there at the level of style, and then of, which is indispensable to it being there at the level of perception as well. Love a great writer. It's often very hard to remember these things afterwards, but I th I'm pretty sure with that one I didn't. It wasn't, it wasn't the climactic scene in my mind. I don't know what, I don't know what was. I knew, I knew what was, I knew how things were going to play out, but I didn't know in which form they would take in the book, if you see what I mean. I, I knew it wasn't going to have a, a happy ending in an obvious way. Sorry, I'm straying from the microphone, aren't I? I'll, I'll stick to it. Um, so, no, no, I, I, I'm sure I probably knew it at a certain point you have with a novel, you are holding threads. It's like a complicated weaving in the air and you're, you suddenly will be aware that there's a strand that has to be knotted off. And that would have been my perception of whatever was unfolding between father and son had to have some clim climactic moment at which it was sort of knotted and, and that it came <coughs> out of that. Is there a lady here, Jane? Oh, right, yes. Hmm. Well, I, I suppose in the story, one has the feeling, I don't follow it through there, that the mum might be that, that she is, in some way, the mum's briskness, her power, her strength in carrying on, is about pushing things away. The fact of this unspoken about failed marriage for instance, is, is sort of meant to be the opposite quality to that passivity, which, which thinking superficially, we often mean that, is, that means people aren't feeling very much. But actually, yes, I'm suggesting that, that the, a contrast between those two contemporaries there, I think. But, uh, but not in such a way as to say that the mother doesn't feel anything or is impervious. It's all too obvious that she does. But I just... 
That, that story has a really odd origin, actually. Shall, shall I talk about that qu very yes. quickly? Um, in that I was reading something about Louis... This is probably going to spoil it for you. I, I don't... No, no. I was reading something about Louis XVI, who was executed in the French Revolution, and about his daughter, who was in prison with her parents and her little brother, and saw her, both her parents taken off to be executed, and her little brother taken away in a very sick state and was never seen again. And what she was like in later life in the Bourbon Restoration France. And the scene where somebody falls on their knees in front of her, w uh, that in, in, to that princess, or whatever she, she was known as the Duchess of Duchesse d'Angoulême or something like that in her later life, um, somebody really did, f that she became a bit of a saint inside the ultra-royalist sections of French society. And, s and somebody fell on their knees in front of her and tried to kiss the hem of her skirt and she just stood like that. And that reading about that moment in history moved me enormously. And I thought, obviously, and you know, I, I wouldn't have anything in common with some crazed, ultra-royalist, conservative French princess. But I would probably feel... I just was admiring of the dignity of that sort of stillness, really, and how you would carry around with you an experience of that order outside the ordinary register. And that's where the story came from. That doesn't answer your question at all, but it's a sort of interesting that, that it was that subject of being receptive and filling out with your fate, but not needing to be a very special person, not needing to be clever or distinctive for the, in, for it, in order for you to be filled out by your fate. That's, that's where that story began, with that little study. Did it spoil it? Now, 